All right, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. So uh, 20 minutes is too short to discuss the entire landscape of treatment for neuroendocrine tumors, so I thought I'd focus on two key systemic therapies, Everolimus and uh, lutetium dotatate, uh, radio-labeled somatostatin analog that was just recently FDA-approved for well-differentiated NETs. Everolimus is an oral mTOR inhibitor, and uh, the mTOR pathway is quite important in neuroendocrine tumors. Sequencing studies show that approximately 15% of pancreatic nets have discrete mutations in mTOR genes, such as P10, TSC1, or 2. Um, but we know that activation of the mTOR pathway is much more ubiquitous, and that's based on uh, studies of phosphorylations of TORC1, TORC2, and downstream targets. There was single arm data in pancreatic nets uh, showing relatively low response rates with Everolimus, but long uh, median durations of PFS, and that led to three key randomized phase three trials, uh, Radian 2, Radian 3, and Radian 4, which basically looked at uh, uh, nearly the entire population of well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumors. Radian 2 was the first. It evaluated uh, uh, Everolimus plus octreotide versus Everolimus plus, sorry, versus placebo plus octreotide in patients with uh, progressive, uh, well-differentiated nets and history of carcinoid syndrome. Um, and as you may know, carcinoid syndrome is primarily associated with midgut nets, small bowel, ileocecal nets, and uh, so this was primarily a midgut neuroendocrine tumor study. Primary endpoint was progression-free survival. And um, I don't know where the pointer is, but it's the, it's the top, top graph. You can see that the, the mouse. Ah, <clears throat> sorry. You can see that uh, there was a relatively modest benefit in terms of hazard ratio. The hazard ratio was 0 0.77, 0 0.77. The p-value was 0 0.026. Uh, the threshold for significance was 0 0.024. So this study actually fell just short of statistical significance. And as a result, uh, Everolimus was not FDA approved for this particular population. The next study was uh, Radian-3. Uh, this was a similar study in pancreatic nets. Um, Everolimus versus placebo, uh, concurrent somatostatin analogs were allowed in some patients, but not, uh, not mandated as in Radian-2. There was also crossover on progression. Uh, this time, the benefit was much more unequivocal. The hazard ratio was 0.35, highly statistically significant. So this led to approval of Everolimus in pancreatic nets. Radian-4 looked at the last piece of the puzzle, patients with progressive non-functional, meaning not hormone-producing, uh, neuroendocrine tumors of the GI tract and lung. So this was primarily a non-midgut uh, study. It looked at a very heterogeneous population of lung nets, gastroduodenal, colorectal, relatively few mid midgut. Uh, this time, concurrent somatostatin analogs were actually prohibited, and there was no crossover. And this time, compared to Radian-2, the benefit was also quite dramatic. Uh, the hazard ratio was 0.48, highly statistically significant. So what accounts for these differences between Radian-4 and functional tumors associated with carcinoid syndrome and Radian-4 in non-functional tumors? Uh, you can see just by comparing the placebo arms that Radian-4 was a much more aggressive tumor population. The median PFS on placebo was 3.9 months. Here it was 11 months. So that's, that's one difference. More aggressive population, perhaps more potential for benefit with Everolimus. And of course, there are other factors, the, the mid-gut versus non-mid-gut, the concurrent somatostatin analog versus not concurrent, uh, of course, the functionality versus non-functional. It's hard to know which accounts for the differences in the benefit with Everolimus. Uh, my suspicion is that the primary site and just the degree of aggressiveness as baseline were the key factors. In any case, Everolimus was approved for this population of non-functional uh, GI and lung neuroendocrine tumors. Uh, with disease progression at baseline. <clears throat> I think it's important to also look at the overall survival curves. Um, Radian 2, we can see that there actually uh, was a trend towards decreased survival with Everolimus. And it's important to emphasize uh, this was not the primary endpoint of the study. The study was not powered uh, to look at overall survival. This was obviously not statistically significant. But since we tend to highlight trends for benefit, I think it's also important to point out that in, here, in this case, there was actually a trend towards decreased survival with Everolimus. In Radian-3, we saw a modest trend towards benefit with Everolimus, and of course, it's important to remem remember that there was crossover. And in Radian-4, we see even in, with no crossover, we see an even stronger trend 
uh, for benefit an overall survival on preliminary analysis that needs to be confirmed on mature analysis. As far as adverse effects, uh, Everolimus uh, has, has a number of important ones. Uh, aphthous ulcers in the mouth are quite common. We now recommend uh, uh, steroid, um, oral steroid prophylaxis, uh, uh, swish and spit for that. Um, rash, diarrhea, hyperglycemia, pneumonitis, increased risk of infection. Uh, these are all potential side effects with Everolimus, and so the drug needs to be monitored closely. So where does Everolimus fit in? Um, there is certainly strong evidence for use in progressive pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors and also other non-midgut neuroendocrine tumors such as colorectal, lung, gastroduodenal. I would say that based on radian 2, there's relatively weak evidence for use in the <coughs> typical sort of midgut neuroendocrine or carcinoid tumor. Um, the side effect profile can sometimes be challenging. Uh, I think it's important to select patients with clinically significant disease progression, not patients with a few millimeter growth over a year, as is often the case with midgut neuroendocrine tumors. And patients who are frail or elderly really require close monitoring, and, and we often start at lower doses than the standard 10 milligrams. So moving on to peptide radio receptor radiotherapy, um, this is a relatively new category of treatment. Um, uh, it, it relies on the fact that most well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumors express high levels of somatostatin receptors, and so by attaching a radionuclide to a somatostatin analog, you can selectively deliver radiation to um, uh, somatostatin receptor-expressing cells. Uh, the treatment has been developed over several decades, uh, starting with indium-111 as the radionuclide, moving on to atrium-90, which is a beta emitter, and more recently, lutetium-177, a beta and gamma emitter, which likely has the best therapeutic index among the three. As far as terminology, it's really quite simple. You have the somatostatin analog, typically either octreotide or octreotate, which has a slightly higher affinity to somatostatin receptor subtype 2. You have a chelator, which is basically a cage that binds the isotope and links it to the somatostatin analog. Uh, the cages used are typically DPTA or DOTA, and then you have the isotope. So lutetium dotatate would be lutetium-177 using a DOTA chelator attached to octreotate in the somatostatin analog. Until recently, most of the data has come from large prospective registries, and the most notable one, I would say, comes from Erasmus Hospital in the Netherlands. This is where this type of therapy was first developed, and where since the year 2000, they have been treating patients exclusively with lutetium-177 dotatate. Uh, the drug is given as an intravenous infusion once every eight weeks for four treatments, 200 millicuries of radiation with each treatment, and with amino acid prophylaxis to uh, reduce nephrotoxicity. So over this 13-year period, uh, they treated over 1,200 patients in total, uh, but the focus of this analysis was on local patients uh, from the Netherlands who were able to uh, complete the entire prospective, uh, prospectively defined follow-up, and uh, particularly focusing on gastroenteropancreatic and lung neuroendocrine tumors. And so uh, there were 600 patients, uh, uh, roughly, uh, that were eligible for safety analysis, and uh, roughly 450 who had completed all four courses of treatment and uh, were um, eligible for uh, efficacy analysis. If we look at efficacy outcomes, uh, these were nicely distinguished uh, between primary site and progressive status at baseline. We can see that among midgut neuroendocrine tumors, the objective response rate was approximately 30%. Um, a little bit higher in pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, particularly those were, that were progressive at baseline, and uh, somewhat in between 30 and 50 percent for patients with uh, uh, neuroendocrine tumors of the um, colorectum, lung, uh, and stomach. Um, median durations of progression-free survival were actually quite similar across the board, approximately 30 months, two and a half years, uh, with the exception of lung neuroendocrine tumors that with a bit of a shorter PFS, median PFS of about 20 months. <clears throat> this is a particularly good study for looking at the long-term toxicity of lutetium dotatate. The two main concerns uh, with this category of treatment have been um, renal toxicity and myelodysplasia. Uh, 
Um, as far as MDS, uh, with a median follow-up of 78 months, 1.5% um, of patients developed myelodysplastic syndrome, additional four patients developed acute leukemia with a median um, occurrence of 28 months after treatment. So we've seen very similar data from other data, uh, databases uh, with long-term follow-up. So I think quoting a figure of about 2% of severe long-term bone marrow toxicity would be a fairly accurate uh, representation. Renal toxicity has been another concern, particularly with yttrium-90, but we see virtually no clinically significant renal toxicity with lutetium dotatate uh, and use of amino acid prophylaxis. And another study using the same database uh, showed a clear correlation between somatostatin receptor expression on Octrea scan and uh, objective response, which is not surprising. Somatostatin receptor imaging looks at the target of this therapy, the somatostatin receptor. Um, obviously, these days, uh, octrea scans have become less important. We're using gallium-68 dotatate scans in which the metastatin receptor expression can be measured as far as SUV uptake. So until recently, all the data came <clears throat> from small phase two studies and uh, prospective registries. The Netter-1 study was the first randomized phase three prospective trial of a radio-labeled somatostatin analog. It evaluated lutetium dotatate given exactly the same schedule as I just described, four treatments over eight months, uh, versus high-dose octreotide in patients with progressive mid-gut neuroendocrine tumors progressing on standard-dose octreotide LAR. The primary endpoint was progression-free survival, and as you can see, there was a highly statist uh, statistically and clinically significant improvement in PFS. Median PFS was roughly eight months with high-dose octreotide. It had not been reached with lutetium dotatate at the time of primary endpoint analysis. Uh, the hazard ratio was 0.21. As far as objective response rates, they were 18 percent with lutetium dotatate, uh, only 3 percent with uh, high-dose octreotide. This was also statistically significant. <clears throat> And preliminary overall survival analysis was quite encouraging uh, with uh, a hazard ratio of 0.4, p-value of 0 0.004, although this, again, is a early analysis of overall survival. Uh, the threshold for significance at this point is 0 0.00008. Uh, the mature overall survival analysis is expected in several years. So just as with the Radiant 4 study, we can say that things are looking encouraging as far as overall survival, but uh, we need to wait for the final analysis. As far as toxicity, um, nausea and vomiting were um, key side effects that really were primarily attributable to the amino acids that were used in the study, which were commercial amino acid formulations. They contain about 20 amino acids, as opposed to the two amino acid arginine lysine uh, formulations used in in the prospective registry that I described earlier that is much less nauseating. Um, for the most part, the nausea tended to subside as soon as the amino acid infusion was stopped. Um, there was a roughly 2% uh, um, rate of uh, grade 3 or 4 thrombocytopenia and neutropenia. There's a much higher rate of lymphopenia, uh, which is not really clinically significant. <coughs> Patients don't develop opportunistic infections with this treatment. So where does PRRT fit in with lutetium dotatate? Uh, we have a phase three randomized study only in mid-gut neuroendocrine tumors, but uh, the earlier phase data that I described earlier shows even higher responses in non-mid-gut neuroendocrine tumors, particularly in pancreatic nets. Uh, based on both the Netter-1 study as well as the prospective registry, um, the FDA as well as the European Medicines Agency approved lutetium dotatate for treatment of well-differentiated gastroenteropancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, not just mid-gut nets. Uh, we think that somatostatin receptor expression is a strong predictive marker. It's certainly an eligibility for treatment. Um, uh, patients need expression at least as high as the liver, but, but the higher the expression, the higher the response rate. Uh, this should certainly be considered as a second line or beyond treatment in patients with strong somatostatin receptor expression. It's generally not considered a first-line treatment um, most of these patients should have progressed on a somatostatin analog of triotide or lanreotide. Uh, the advantages include a, a limited treatment course. This is not something that needs to be taken on a daily basis. It's, it's, it's only for treatments. Um, 
there is the option of retreating a progression. Maximum lifetime dose is approximately eight treatments. Um, but to retreat, you really want to see a benefit with the, with the first course of therapy. And that's usually defined as a, um, a PFS of at least a, a year or longer. There are some practical points. Um, um, in the United States, at least, uh, this can be administered on an outpatient basis. Patients do not need to be uh, admitted um, uh, to an isolation room. The particle range, the median particle range of uh, the beta um, emitting isotope lutetium-177 is extremely short, only two millimeters. So there's actually a much lower uh, risk to family members and uh, caregivers uh, than we see with uh, radioiodine used in thyroid cancer. Um, generally, the recommendations are to avoid very close contact. In other words, try sh not to share a bed for about a week, avoid children to some extent for a week after each treatment. And these are conservative recommendations. Now that the treatment is FDA approved, I think it's going to be important to um, think about the type of amino acid uh, used concurrently with lutetium dotatate. Um, the commercial formulations are the same use of TPM. They use about 20 amino acids. Uh, it requires two liters of administration. Um, this is very hard for patients to tolerate. You have to start low and sort of gradually titrate upwards, and they still get a lot of nausea. Um, at our institution, uh, we're, we're planning to start uh, treating patients very sh shortly, and we're going to uh, use a compounded formulation of arginine lysine. Uh, exactly has been used in Europe over many decades. This is much more tolerable for patients. They can tolerate high rates of infusion uh, with virtually no uh, nausea or vomiting. So I strongly encourage considering uh, compounded formulation. One key question is how long is, or whether at all you need to hold a long-acting somatostatin analog before treatment. Um, the theoretical concern is that um, when you um, administer octreotide or lanreotide, uh, you're competing uh, for receptor uptake with the radiolabeled somatostatin analog. But what we see in practice, at least with imaging, is that uh, treatment with somatostatin analog actually seems to have very little impact on um, radiotracer uptake. So if you look at this, uh, for example, um, gallium-68 dotatate scan on a patient not exposed to a somatostatin analog and then subsequently exposed to a somatostatin analog, there's really very different, little difference in tumoral uptake, but in fact, the background uptake in the liver and spleen is less. So at least in theory, uh, and, th and this is just one example from several published studies uh, um, illustrating this phenomenon. So in theory, at least, concurrent treatment with a somatostatin analog actually might improve the therapeutic index of the drug, but the bottom line is we just don't know. In the FDA label, they say uh, patients need to wait four weeks from the last somatostatin analog, which means that uh, if you treat patients with octreotide or lanreotide every four weeks, you can simply administer the lutetium dotatate at the very end of that four-week cycle and, and therefore not have to interrupt their uh, somatostatin analog dose. And, you know, uh, for patients with carcinoid syndrome, continuation of somatostatin analog is important. Uh, for patients with non-functional tumors who progress on a somatostatin analog, I don't think they necessarily need to continue their somatostatin analog. It was continued in all patients on the NETR1 study, uh, but it's certainly, in my opinion, not, not mandatory.